Good evening, everybody. Uh, by everybody, I mean about 470 people um, from many countries. It is a huge privilege for UCL, my institute, IBIL, and 8 New Square, my old chambers, um, to present two webinars on intellectual property and COVID-19. This is the first of them, and it is the, probably the one that most people would think of immediately. That is to say, patent rights, or probably entirely patent rights, maybe design rights to engineering rights, over things for actually dealing with COVID-19. The second session in a week's time will be on more indirect things like tracing and privacy and what publishers should do and, and other things, and competition authorities and other things. The way it's going to work, we, we've thought about whether you, we, you could ask questions uh, directly by putting your hand up. But quite frankly, with the numbers we've got, we think it might become unmanageable and really rather unsatisfactory. And so we did invite people to send in questions in advance uh, and that we did. And the result is that the, uh, all our panel have seen those questions and will to, to a large extent include um, their answers to the questions in their talks. We envisage that the speakers will occupy between them just under an hour, but then they will debate amongst themselves. I may intervene a little bit here and there, but I, I think one of the most valuable ways of discussing some of the things that we're going to talk about is by a panel debate. Um, uh, I'm only now going to begin just for, just want because I really want to show off with a little bit of Latin, but it's also got something profound. Silent enim leges inter arma. In BC 52, Marcus Tullius Cicero used those words in his defense speech on behalf of a man called Titus Annius Milo on trial for murder. The phrase is loosely translated as in times of war, the law falls silent. And one view is that IP rights should all just fall away in time of war. Lord Atkin, one of the greatest English judges, did not agree. In the middle of the war, when the question was whether the government in effect had the right to detain anybody they wanted to, he dissented with a, a famous speech which included this sentence, in this country and with the clash of arms, the laws are not silent. They may be changed, but they, may sp they speak the same language in war as in peace. Uh, and one of the subjects we're going to talk about is whether the laws should be changed. But I don't know that anybody, or on this panel anyway, advocates that the law should simply stand by. I'm, the first speaker is Michael Conway, and he's going to more specifically talk about what the law can do by way of suspending or modifying intellectual property rights um, in the United Kingdom. Now, this is a, a tricky subject because it's different in different countries all around the world. But the United Kingdom is not so different from some other countries and that it's not worth talking about. And so I now turn over to Michael Conway. Well, thanks very much, Robin. Um, hopefully you can uh, see my slides now. Um, so, yeah, the idea behind this introductory talk was really to do some scene setting um, as to the um, statutory and judicial mechanisms that are in place in relation to patent enforcement um, and the, what is in place to um, protect the public interest and, 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 and the mechanisms that there are to ensure um, that the exercise of patent rights 
doesn't unduly interfere with um, making available um, new drugs or treatments in a crisis like the one that we're currently facing. And as Robin said, I'm going to look mainly at the UK and focus mainly on the grant or withholding of injunctions, but I'll have a little look um, at overseas um, jurisdictions as well. Um, so starting with the statute, there are two key provisions or, or rather groups of provisions that it's important to be aware of. Uh, the first is crown use, and that provides a mechanism by which uh, a government department can authorize activity that would otherwise uh, infringe a patent uh, without the consent of the proprietor where uh, that activity is determined to be in the service of the crown. And one of the things that can be in the service of the crown um, is the production uh, or supply of um, specified drugs and medicines. So one can see that um, in, 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 a, in a crisis like the current one, uh, if the government determined that it was necessary to ensure the supply of a particular medicine or product, um, then it could invoke these provisions to ensure that that happened. Uh, and there have been a number of questions relating to crown use and the extent to which it would be applicable um, at, at the current time. Um, uh, so, so that's, that's a, a brief overview. But one of the questions was how it related to um, the government's recent indemnity scheme that it's proposed in relation to the manufacture of uh, ventilators. I, I, I don't know a great deal about the scheme, and I think it hasn't really been worked through, so it might be an interesting discussion point. But certainly, from what I understand, what the government is proposing doesn't go as far as crown use. It's not talking about the expropriation of patents. Um, it's talking about uh, indemnifying manufacturers were they to be um, sued for infringement of patents uh, as a result of their activity. So, in my view, it's not a, as belt and braces an approach as crown use, and I'm not quite sure why the government has chosen to go down the route that it has, but that might be um, an interesting point um, of debate. Uh, so that's crown use. The other key area is compulsory licensing, uh, and that's a mechanism by which uh, a person can apply to the controller of patents for the mandatory grant of a license uh, where specific circumstances exist. Uh, and one of those circumstances is where um, the pattern in question relates to a product or process for which there is a demand in the UK that is not being met on reasonable terms. So although compulsory licensing provisions don't specifically call out the public interest or the supply of, of medicines, um, nonetheless one can see how they could be called into play um, if um, a, a specific uh, treatment or, or product uh, wasn't being made available or was being prevented from being made available. Um, by a patent. Um, so, so that's the statute. Uh, what about the courts? Well, uh, the grant or withholding of an injunction is an equitable remedy, and so it's always uh, at the court's discretion. And certainly since um, the Supreme Court decision in Coventry and Lawrence, but before then really, but very clearly in that case, um, it's been clear that, um, that the public interest uh, can and should be taken into account. Um, in, in, in considering whether to grant an injunction or whether instead to award uh, damages. Uh, patents, though, are to some extent a creature unto themselves in that they are a specific property right and there is a specific statute relating to their grant or enforcement. Um, and uh, that's important and, and the courts will have regard to that um, in exercising their discretion. And that principle was, was um, made quite clear in, um, in that Chiron case that I've referred to there, where Mr. Justice Aldous uh, criticized the defendant for uh, seeking in the courts what he said was effectively a compulsory license without going through the, the statutory loopholes. Um, so that's an important supervening factor uh, in relation to patents. Uh, the other thing to bear in mind um, is the uh, European Enforcement Directive um, in relation to which any remedies for any intellectual property right uh, shall be, uh, among other things, proportionate. And how that's applied in the UK courts and in relation to injunction for patents um, is probably best encapsulated in the Virgin and, and Premium case that I've mentioned there, where one um, Lord Justice Jacob said that um, injunctive relief would 
normally be given uh, unless the enforcement would be uh, grossly disproportionate. So um, proportionality will be taken into consideration, but it's quite a high bar uh, that a potential infringer has to meet in order to avoid um, facing an injunction. So how does that all uh, play out in practice? Well, um, there is a, a recent uh, case um, in this area, and it's a very good place to go to, to see how the courts will approach their discretion um, in the case of uh, a medical device. Uh, and that's Al Evelve and, and Edwards. And that case concerned uh, medical devices for treating heart valve disorder. Um, and the disorder was called, it's called mitral regurgitation. Um, and it occurs where the mitral valve of the heart is diseased and so you get this situation where the leaflets don't meet properly um, and what can happen then is when the heart beats the blood um, can flow back up uh, the wrong way through the valve of the heart and that can lead to a very uh, debilitating um, and indeed life-threatening uh, condition. And the devices in question were a kind of clip that you could insert through a catheter um, that pulled together the valves of the heart and prevented that from happening. Abbott had a product, MitraClip, on the market, had proven highly successful. Edwards had developed uh, 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 its own device called Pascal, and in an earlier decision, um, Pascal had been found to infringe two of Abbott's patents. But Edwards nevertheless argued that uh, there should be no injunction because it said that in the reasonable judgment of clinicians, um, Pascal offered some benefits uh, for patients um, uh, such that some patients uh, might only be able to be treated or be better treated uh, by Pascal. And the judge, uh, Mr. Justice Burst, ultimately rejected Edward's case. But as I said, his, his judgment is a very good place to go if one wants to understand how the courts will approach their discretion uh, in the case of a medical device that was for uh, a life-threatening condition. Um, so the courts clearly do have a discretion to withhold an injunction where it would be in the public interest. But it is one to be exercised with caution. Um, and the judge placed a lot of emphasis on what I touched on earlier, that there are existing statutory safeguards um, that have been carefully weighed up by Parliament. And the court should be very reluctant to, in exercising their discretion, uh, supervene those, that system of checks and balances that Parliament has arrived at. Um, specifically in relation to the clinical setting, the judge also doubted that public interest would be raised sufficiently unless one is talking about um, a condition that could potentially be uh, life-threatening. But even then, there was no general exception for such products. And he held that it wasn't sufficient uh, to establish that some clinicians might reasonably think that a potentially infringing device could offer some benefits to patients, or even that it might be the case that some lives uh, could be saved. It, there had to be some objective evidence to establish that that was the case. Um, and so he, he found that, that, that Edwards had effectively not set the bar high enough by only seeking to prove that clinicians in their reasonable judgment would think that Pascal uh, could be a better treatment. And in any event, the evidence uh, didn't support um, that there were um, uh, clear clinical um, benefits. So that's uh, Abbott and, uh, and Edwards, and that's really the latest word on how the UK courts will approach um, this issue. And just thinking about how that might play out in practice in a, in a, in a pandemic like, like the current one, I think it's pretty clear that where you're talking about um, a situation where there is no alternative uh, to a treatment or to a vaccine. It's very hard to see how in practice um, patent enforcement would interfere with making that treatment or product available to the public. Now, there are the statutory provisions um, that I touched on, uh, but even if a case like that came before the court, it's very difficult to imagine a UK court at least um, from exercising its discretion and granting with a, a, an injunction, the effect of which would be to prevent a treatment um, that would save lives being made available. Um, and in fact, it's quite hard to imagine a patentee in those scenarios ever actually seeking uh, injunctive relief. Uh, and historically, um, they haven't done so. 
obviously more of a grey area when one's faced with the sort of Abbott Edwards situation where there is an existing product, um, but it's argued that the infringing product has some, um, some material uh, benefit. And there, uh, the court will weigh up the evidence, but at least following the Abbott case, um, there has to be established some objective evidence that the new and the infringing product will indeed um, save the lives or improve the lives of patients. And, and finally, just a, 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 the supply of, a, of generic drugs or, or generic versions of, of existing treatments, um, because this was also something that um, some people raised in, in questions. It's obviously much more difficult to see how a public interest is raised where one's just talking about supplying um, effectively the same drug that's already available to patients. But one can imagine, for example, if there are supply chain issues where the patentee or a licensee is, for whatever reason, unable to meet um, the demand for a product like uh, a, a, a new drug for, uh, for COVID-19, for example. And in those scenarios, then one can see how the statutory protections could be brought into play. Uh, and indeed, that was something that Mr. Justice Burst remarked on, uh, as it turned out, quite presciently in the Abbott case, where he, he refers to um, special cases like um, a pandemic disease. And that would be a situation where one could imagine crown use provisions uh, being brought into play. So that's the background as far as the UK goes. And just a brief look uh, at jurisdictions overseas. Um, I, I've set out a, a question there at the top. It's actually a, a question that Robin raised rather than me, but it's, it's an interesting one as to whether the flexibility that is inherent in common law jurisdictions might be better able to accommodate the public interest um, in a health crisis like the one uh, that we're currently facing. And that's perhaps an interesting point for discussion, but it's certainly the case that uh, in civil law jurisdictions, I'm gonna take Germany as the paradigm example of, of European jurisdictions here. Um, there are statutory protections that are in place and Germany has in its Patents Act uh, provisions for compulsory licensing where that would be in the public interest. There's also a provision, I think it's section 13 of the German Patents Act, similar to crown use. But once one's outside of that statutory scheme, the courts really have very little, if any, discretion to uh, withhold an injunction where a patent is found to be uh, valid and infringed. So there perhaps isn't that additional backstop that we have in, in, in the UK where a court can say, well, I don't, for whatever reason, the statutory conditions haven't been met or haven't been invoked, but you're telling me that this order would result in patients' lives being lost. I'm simply not prepared to make that order uh, and I, I, I'll exercise my discretion in that way. So it's an interesting question as to whether that, uh, the common law um, has a, an additional string to its bow in that regard. Um, and as I've mentioned there, in the US, uh, the public interest again is a, is a key factor that the courts will consider in, in granting or withholding an injunction. Uh, and that's part of the test in the eBay uh, and, and, and Merck case. So uh, perhaps an interesting difference to consider and, and, and people may want to debate about whether um, common law jurisdiction is indeed best suited um, to deal with uh, public health needs um, like that. But I'm no doubt over my 10 minute slot. So uh, at that, uh, I'll leave it for Robin to hand on to the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, Mark, you're next. Um, and you're, you're going to talk about your initiative. Great. Thank you, Sir Robin. Uh, and thank you all for being here. Um, so uh, Michael gave you a useful background on uh, what the courts and the statute might do. Um, I want to switch uh, gears a little bit to talk about what uh, people actually are doing uh, around intellectual property in the wake of the pandemic. Um, so the, um, uh, the Open COVID Pledge is a group that uh, is uh, both um, US and um, uh, UK, as well as other folks in Europe. Uh, we've got a recent extension into Japan that I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, and it's a combination of scientists and legal people uh, who put together uh, the 
uh, voluntary commitment of intellectual property owners uh, not to enforce or seek royalties for critical technology uh, during the course of the pandemic in order to promote uh, a use of uh, testing uh, research uh, and potentially life-saving technology. Uh, so a little bit of background here. Um, uh, we have already seen a number of circumstances in which uh, folks have uh, either deliberately or uh, through kind of uh, existing licensing structures uh, imposed some actual or potential restrictions on access to, um, uh, access to technology that's useful in fighting COVID-19. Um, uh, and the question is, what do we do about that? Uh, one thing we might do about it, as Michael told you in the courts, is uh, the normal run of a, of a lawsuit uh, and deciding whether or not we should uh, uh, change the outcome of that lawsuit and in particular uh, restrict injunctive relief. Uh, but there are also other structural things that both governments and private parties can do. Uh, and those fit into three basic categories. Um, uh, one, which Michael's adverted to, is compulsory licensing. Uh, so compulsory licensing is authorized under TRIPS uh, and uh, the Doha Declaration. Uh, it has been used in the past to compel access to medicines in developing countries. Um, uh, there are limited mechanisms, uh, both in the UK and the, in the US, to uh, to permit compulsory licensing. Uh, in the United States, those mechanisms take the form of either a bi-dole so-called march-in right. This allows the government to come in and compel licensing if the government had funded the uh, creation of the patent in the first place, uh, but it's never been used. Um, and effectively a compulsory license in the form of government use. It turns out that while you can sue the United States government for infringement, all you can get is reasonable compensation in the form of damages. You can't get injunctive relief. And that's led to the, at least the possibility that uh, the government can sort of break a patent uh, uh, authorizing uh, its contractors to use it and agreeing to pay compensation. That too uh, is not been used uh, regularly. It's used regularly in the sense that the government infringes patents, but I don't think it's regularly used as a deliberate uh, policy uh, to uh, to avoid injunctive relief. Um, we've seen compulsory licensing measures throughout the world in response to COVID-19 in a number of countries, um, uh, including Canada, um, uh, Costa Rica, uh, Israel, and others um, uh, that have basically come in to say, uh, if there's important technology and a life-saving drug or a vaccine, uh, we will compel access to it on reasonable terms. We also have a series of private organizations uh, designed to do things to clear a uh, potential uh, backlog or blocking situation of intellectual property rights. Uh, the classic one of these is a, is a patent pool, uh, right, where too many owners have intellectual property rights, they'll often uh, get together and agree to cross license those rights to, pre to produce an integrated product, uh, one that they can then offer at the price the, the pool collectively chooses. We've seen efforts in previous pandemics to put together such a pool uh, in the biopharma space. Uh, one of the problems with it is large companies with large groups of lawyers negotiating rights among patents that they all consider very valuable have in many circumstances continued those negotiations past the end of the pandemic uh, itself. Uh, now, we should be so lucky in this case that the pandemic ends before we figure out our intellectual property rights situation, uh, but it is not a fast process. Uh, the, there's also non-governmental organizations have tried to sort of create similar clearinghouses. The medicines patent pool uh, under the WHO uh, has been sort of trying to create a collective uh, mechanism to, to license uh, needed drugs in the developing world. Uh, but it too has not been fast. Um, uh, it's a very uh, kind of cumbersome process uh, and it also uh, uh, varies in whether or not you're gonna charge the, uh, the companies and how much you're gonna charge. So what we wanted to do was something quicker and simpler uh, in response to the fast moving nature of the, of the current pandemic. Uh, the patent pledge uh, that we have in mind here is a voluntary public commitment by a patent holder to limit the enforcement or utilization of their patents. Uh, 
uh, in a, not in exchange for compensation, but without compensation, but for a limited time and for a limited purpose, for the purpose of responding to the pandemic in the short run. This is not a, a, a waiver of all patent rights going forward. Uh, this, is a, this is a defined and limited universe of pledge. We've seen some companies independent of the open COVID pledge uh, make pledges of their own. Uh, the Wellcome Trust uh, notably uh, uh, made such a pledge. Uh, Medtronic opened uh, access to its ventilator designs to allow anyone to manufacture uh, ventilator designs consistent with it. Um, uh, and in, we, as we sat down to, to design the pledge for COVID-19, uh, we wanted it to be something that was simple, right? Something that uh, you didn't need to hire a lawyer to read it or to figure out whether or not um, uh, you uh, uh, could use particular technology. You didn't need to hire a lawyer to figure out whether you wanted to grant it away. Um, uh, we created a very limited set of licenses. There are two basic canonical licenses in the pledge, and I'll show them to you in a minute. Um, uh, the idea is to have a kind of uniform platform in which people can say, okay, this company has committed under principles that are simple that we all understand, uh, not to bring a lawsuit uh, for a limited period, uh, and so we can use that technology. Uh, that allows accelerated adoption of that technology and in many cases allows networks of researchers to, to build and work around that technology. The pledge is self-executing. It is a public license, a commitment that the company makes and signs, uh, posts publicly on its website, but it doesn't require a negotiated contract with each user. Uh, that too speeds the process and makes it cheaper. Importantly, this is, as I mentioned, not a waiver, uh, not a giveaway. Uh, it is a, a limited license for use in responding to the COVID pandemic, and there's a definition of what that means in the license. And for a limited time, uh, it extends as long as the WHO has declared the pandemic in effect plus a year, uh, but can also sunset no later than November of 2023. Uh, so companies are not irrevocably or even uh, committing the uh, intellectual property for an indefinite period of time. Uh, they can limit the time and scope of that commitment. Within that commitment, there's no payment. Uh, it is free. Uh, as the open source folks have it, it's free uh, not only is in free speech, but also is in free beer. Uh, if you are going to use the technology uh, for purposes related to COVID-19, you are free to do so. So. Uh, one question that might be worth asking is, well, why not just give away your intellectual property uh, altogether? Some companies want to do that, are happy to do that. We think there are actually some benefits to uh, holding on to the intellectual property and granting it in this more limited form of a pledge. One is a defensive use. We have a defensive suspension provision, which means that uh, if other people sue you for infringing their intellectual property related to COVID-19, you can withdraw the pledge as to those people. Uh, and so that will deter uh, intellectual property attacks by avoiding a form of unilateral disarmament. Uh, as mentioned, we've also limited uh, the duration and the scope. Uh, so you can license these patents for money outside the scope of COVID-19. You can license them once the pledge ends and so forth. Uh, uh, here's the basic uh, pledge and you'll have access to these slides. So I'm not gonna walk you through the, the text of it, uh, but it is, as you'll see, pretty simple. Here's the basic commitment um, and here's the license. This is not a summary of the license, this is the license. Uh, there are, as I mentioned, two forms, but this is the basic one. Uh, the, the principal terms of that license, uh, they focus on patents and copyrights. You don't have an obligation either to give away your, uh, your trade secrets uh, or, to, or to grant rights to your, to your brands. Um, uh, they are your rights and only the rights that you can grant, not uh, uh, rights you have from someone else. Uh, the field of use is diagnosing, preventing, containing, and treating COVID-19. Uh, there are some discussions in the, um, uh, in the FAQ section about uh, the definitions of those terms and what they include, but it definitely includes scientific research uh, directed at the problem. Uh, and it lasts for the duration of the WHO declared pandemic plus a year, uh, but no later than January of 2023. We've talked about some of these other provisions. There are also customized licenses that we've posted on the site which are compatible with but differ in certain respects. Um, uh, a couple of things that are not included that are worth mentioning. 
there are no warranties granted. Uh, there is no indemnification granted. Uh, this is a kind of take as is situation. Um, uh, we do not require grant backs and a number of people have pushed back on that. This is not an open source license in which I'm giving you things for free, but you must in turn open your things to the world for free. There is a defensive suspension, so you can't sue me, but companies can take the intellectual property, use it in research, and if they themselves come up with something uh, 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 useful out of that, they are not committed uh, to, to share that with the world. They're not committed to uh, not charge price uh, uh, for, for their developed technology. Again, the goal is to open up the tools we need, uh, not to say we're creating a separate ecosystem in which things must always be free. So we think this is compatible with intellectual property owners who do eventually hope to get paid. Uh, we've had very wide adoption, um, uh, particularly in the high tech industry. Uh, there are hundreds of thousands of committed patents uh, around the world. Uh, some of the notable adopters include IBM, Microsoft, a uh, number of universities, Hewlett Packard Enterprise, um, Intel, uh, and, uh, and several national labs, uh, including the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and the Sandia National Labs in the United States. Um, the, the adoptions have been primarily for devices. Uh, and computer and, uh, and mechanical technologies, right? We don't have widespread adoption in the pharmaceutical industry, and we can talk about why that might be true. Uh, but I think the pharmaceutical industry still sees stars in their eyes when it comes to a, a possible successful vaccine. We are in the process of building and institutionalizing this, not just in the US and Europe, but on an international basis. As I mentioned uh, two weeks ago, uh, a partner group, the Open COVID Declaration, uh, was put together in Japan, signed by 47 Japanese companies, including many of their largest companies, Canon, Toyota, uh, Minolta, and the like. Um, and uh, we're building uh, linkages and alliance for efforts around uh, uh, the world. Um, the, uh, the purpose here, right, is to, is to enable people to solve the problems that need to be solved right now without spending six months to a year talking about how to, uh, how to work out a license to get access to the technology you use, uh, to allow IPR sharing uh, that we could apply not just here, but in the next pandemic or other areas uh, where, uh, where a cooperative action is necessary. Uh, in addition to intellectual property, we have a number of institutions and organizations that have supported the uh, pledge. Uh, you are welcome uh, to join us, uh, either as a grantor or a supporter. Uh, and with that, I will stop uh, and turn it back to Sir Robert. Thank you, Mark. Um, Professor Mark Anderson of, of, of UCL is one of the world's greatest experts on, on IP licensing. And he has been providing a similar sort of thing, um, and not to UCL, curiously, you don't seem to know he exists, but, but to Imperial College <laughs> and some other places too. And it's, 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 I've, I've seen the, the things and um, no doubt we can make them available if Mark will allow us to do that in due course after, after this event's over. Thomas has arrived. <laughs> Welcome, Thomas. I should say Thomas Craney was not here earlier because he was at, at a very big meeting involving the World Health Organization and the Gates Foundation and, and, and I gather some others too. But he's arrived in time, so we, we did the, the legals, Thomas, before you arrived, um, which was the plan. We, we've talked about licensing and so on and so forth. But we're now going to talk about a specific instance of development um, and, and, and Professor Lomas is actually really interesting, not only on uh, sort of what they've done specifically by way of this breathing device, but also about the state of the pandemic himself. I mean, we have got one of the top people in the world here. Away you go, David. Thank you. Let me see if I can just share my screen. There we go. Can you see that? Yeah, can you see that, Robin? Great, okay. So thanks very much, um, Robin, for the very kind invitation to come and speak. I, I am very unusual. I, I am not a lawyer. I am a, a simple doctor. Um, I'm the Vice Provost Health at UCL, um, head of the medical school, and uh, my responsibility is for biomedicine at, at the university. 
it's one of the largest groupings of biomedical scientists in Europe. I'm also a practicing respiratory physician, and I've worked through the COVID crisis at UCH, particularly during the surge, which in London was uh, the, the Easter weekend. So what I want to tell you about is, is work of, from a remarkable team of people from diverse backgrounds who've come together to develop a, a device, to reverse engineer a device to help uh, breathing in patients with COVID lung disease. And the, um, the collection of people come from healthcare engineering at UCL, uh, from the hospital, from Mercedes, uh, AMG High Performance Powertrain, they're the F1 Mercedes team, and many of the partners who've give, given their time uh, freely in order to try and develop this programme. So let me, if I may, present the background and the context. So I was on clinical service uh, at the beginning of March, and uh, I saw one of the first patients come in with COVID lung disease, with infection, and at that stage, the NHS guidelines were to treat with oxygen and then if the patient deteriorated to put them on a mechanical ventilator. So what the team at UCLH did and my colleague Mervyn Singer did unusually is to phone up people who already had the COVID infection and said what did you learn? What did you learn from this that we can that we could copy? And he, he phoned up colleagues in Italy and China and they said you know what you should use a CPAP breathing device to try and help people uh, stay off ventilators because once you get onto a ventilator you're on there for about one to two weeks the mortality is about 50 percent so so keeping people off ventilators would be a really good idea so our suggested pathway was to go from oxygen therapy this breathing device called a CPAP continuous positive airway pressure device and then if you fail that onto a ventilator but here were the problems and the problems were, were that there weren't sufficient devices in the UK for a surge that was meant to be a quarter of a million people in this country. Uh, CPAP actually wasn't on the NHS care pathway, so we couldn't even use it. Um, if you ask the government, the government were interested in ventilators. They'd identified, or at least their, their team had identified ventilators as a problem, and therefore they'd set out the ventilator challenge, and so CPAPs were not a priority. And we only had a month, because the surge was expected in London in Easter. So that, that was the sort of time scale. Uh, let me illustrate what, what I mean. So on the left hand side is a standard mechanical ventilator and this is a tube as you can see inserted into the patient's throat and through into their lungs and very simply the patient is paralyzed in a light intensive care and the ventilator machine at the top does the breathing for the patient. Administer oxygen, blows air in and withdraws carbon dioxide. On the right hand side is a CPAP device. A CPAP device is very simply a mask that's, that's fitted tightly to a patient's face and you use the oxygen flow to develop pressure, it splints the airways open so you can get more oxygen into the body for the same amount of oxygen, uh, oxygen delivered. And you can see that that requires very little intensive care support, very few nurses, and actually uh, patients are awake and alert uh, as part of this process. Yeah. So these were the timelines. So the story, as always, in, or as often in the university world, started in a, in a public house. It started in the bar at UCL, uh, where on the 17th of March, a team of doctors um, and UCL healthcare engineers met with friends who had close links with the F Formula One motorsport industry. And they thought, what could they do that they could manufacture rapidly in order to make an impact on this pandemic? And they remember that about 10 years ago in routine clinical practice was a device called a whisper flow. And it was a block, I'll show you a picture in a minute, that had no plugs, no electrics, no moving parts, but actually could be manufactured very quickly. It was off patent, so there were no patent issues and it could be, it could be put into clinical practice. So from the design in the evening on the 17th of March, they then contacted Mercedes uh, AMG high performance powertrain team. And, and within a hundred hours, they'd reverse engineered a device. They'd, they'd taken the plans of the old device. They'd also bought one on eBay, interestingly. They'd got one from the UCL Museum and they'd made the prototype, as you can see on the right. So this is what it looks like. It's, it's to scale, you can see that, that individual's hands. The airflow, it flows in from the top right here. There's an on-off valve, a valve that affects flow, a valve that adjusts oxygen. This black circle is to draw air from the atmosphere. It's mixed with the, the, the flow from the in, inlet, and that here goes to the, go through to the patient. The first device was designed to mimic what had gone before, because we needed regulatory approval, and it was easier to get regulatory approval for a design that already existed. 
But Mercedes, who are quite good with oxygen flows, redesigned it, made it better, and within a few days had actually improved the device by up to 70%. Our healthcare engineers also changed the, the tubing, the valves, so they optimised the amount of, of, of benefit you could get for a given amount of oxygen therapy. So I, I thought the timeline may be interesting, because remember, we are working against time. We are working against a surge, which was going to happen in a, in a, in a, in a month's time. And, and all of this, you must imagine, for those of you who are old enough, um, the Live Aid concert from the 1980s, Bob Geldof thumping the table and saying, people are dying. And it was a bit like that as we drove this particular uh, particular uh, discovery or particular device. So the team met on the 17th. On the 18th, Betty, Becky Shipley, who's a professor of healthcare engineering, phoned me up and said, David, I need to get to the MHRA, but no one will talk to me. Can you help? On the evening of the 19th, I received an email from number 10 uh, saying... David, could you just tell me who MHRA are? Yeah, sorry, the Medicine Healthcare Regulatory Authority. So in order to get a device into man, we need medicine healthcare regulatory authority approval. We need a stamp of approval before we can use it. So, so I'd been contacted by number 10 that evening because they wanted PCR blocks, polymerized chain reaction blocks, for the testing facility which was set up at Milton Keynes. And UCL is a big university. We gave 16 devices that were then taken off to Milton Keynes. And I said to number 10, that's fine, now give me the details of the head of MHRA because I need to make contact. My email went at 21.46 and an hour later I'd had a reply. We, we were in extraordinary times. Um, the prototype, as you can see, arrived um, on the 22nd of March, having been, having, with, with, having been um, thought of for the first time on the 17th of March. Uh, the NHS issued new guidance. We changed the, the, uh, the pathway by which these, these devices could be used. So it was then reissued at NHS uh, care pathway. So, so it went from oxygen to this device to, to, to ventilators. Um, the NHS issued contracts to the engineering team, which allowed them to avoid lockdown. They needed to come into London to work to develop these devices at a time the government were locking down the population. And then some, uh, some 10 days after the first idea, the prototype was approved by the Medicine and Healthcare Regulatory Authority, which means that we could then start trials in MAM. So we started evaluating that at UCLH and our, our, our sister hospitals. Um, and at that stage, the honest truth is we were floundering. I, my job was to try and put this supply chain together um, we had to promise Mercedes that the government would buy this. We had to promise the people who made oxygen sensors and the tubing that this was all going to be OK and there would be money. And it was, as you can imagine, uh, rather aspirational at the, at the time. But the Cabinet Office uh, understood what we were trying to do and said they would commission 100 devices, which meant that we could secure the supply chain, build confidence with our suppliers and then try and put together a device. We then issued a press release and on the 30th of March uh, it hit the press and for those of you who live in the UK you might remember Fergus Walsh reporting from the intensive care unit at University College Hospital on this device. It was the lead story on the Today programme which is a, which is a, a, um, a prestigious well-recognised um, lead current affairs, uh, affairs programme and it, it, went, it went all around the world. It's the most successful press release that, that our university has ever done in terms, of, in terms of uptake. That evening I had a phone call with the Department of Health and Social Care and in the space of 20 minutes they commissioned 10,000 devices at about £2,000 each, it was a rough guess, about 20 million pounds and they wanted as many as possible by the 15th of April. It was as easy as that. The conversation was 20 minutes and that was the commitment. But where we were at UCL is that we were, we were trying to help the government so we manufactured them at probably about 20% less than the real cost. We didn't charge the state's costs or the staff time or equipment. Or equipment. The state charged nothing at all apart from the cost of the device. Um, so, so we wanted uh, indemnification from the government. UCL doesn't make medicine, medicine and healthcare uh, devices, nor does Mercedes. Um, the government said, we can't indemnify you completely. Uh, UCL needs to have some skin in the game. And so we agreed a five million pound liability that we covered in insurance. And you have to remember, I am a doctor negotiating, uh, negotiating contracts that we could then get through the university. The Mark II device was made by Mercedes on the 2nd of April. 
Uh, by the 8th of April, the contract that we've negotiated with, uh, with the government was signed by the minister. And by the 15th of April, um, some less than about two weeks from, from where we started, 10,000 devices were delivered to the NHS. Uh, the logistics team, G10, greatly helped with packaging and delivery. So this is where we are. About a thousand devices were, were circulated at the peak of the surge of the, of the pandemic. They went to 60 hospitals in, the, in, the, in England, the devolved nations, the Crown dependencies and the overseas territories. There are more now in the warehouse that are available for the second surge and the government's trading them or offering them to, to other countries. After the press release, we were then approached from all over the world to see whether we could manufacture for different countries. Um, and, and we decided at UCL that we would make this design open source. We didn't patent it. We wanted to do the right things for humanity, a bit like Marx just described. And so we made them free to download for manufacturers, research institutions, healthcare providers, and the nonprofit sectors. And in those drawings, uh, we, we, what we made available was the drawings, the schematics, the bill of materials, how they're developed, how they're assembled, and the various testing uh, procedures. Again, I was faced with another busy weekend talking to lawyers, and this was a, a legal firm that worked with us all weekend giving pro bono legal advice, and it, they were truly, truly fabulous. And what I learned as a doctor is it's actually quite hard to give something away. Uh, we, didn't, we, didn't, we didn't actually want any money for this. Uh, we wanted to just give it away to the wider community. Um, and and it, it turned out that, of course, I'm, I'm unable, as many of you will know, you can't contract out uh, any, uh, death or personal injury from negligence or fraud. And we had to retain some liability that we minimised down to £10,000. £10, but nevertheless, uh, we started the discussions on the 4th of April. On the 5th of April, 24 hours, we had a fully signed agreement. And the day later, it was released on a dedicated platform by UCL Business. So this is, this is uh, where we are now. Some 1,835 downloads have taken place across 105 countries. Uh, 20 teams across the world have now manufactured prototypes, including in Brazil, Bulgaria, Canada, Colombia, Germany, India, Iran, Mexico, Russia, South Africa, and the United States. And you're pleased to know that when they come out, they all have a UCL logo on. Uh, so, so, the, so the brand uh, ricochets around, uh, around the world. So we work with these people to try and help them. Uh, we're working with the World Health Organizations and with Duffid, David, Duffid, um, we provide, uh, provide technical support and manufacturing support. The Medicines and Healthcare Regulatory Authority have been fabulous and we'll work with local regulatory authorities to say what they've approved in order to get these through into patient care as quickly as possible. We deal with uh, queries around the supply chains and access to materials and the group run a series of webinars and online discussions. Key things for people to think about are oxygen supplies. These only work when you've got piped oxygen. PPE is critical. We need to think about the supply of breathing circuits and consumables, and we provide training materials for, for interested parties. So, so in summary, um, we've basically worked at scale and pace in a remarkable team with the most wonderful colleagues in the world to deliver 10,000 breathing, breathing devices in 15 days. We've redesigned the NHS care pathway for patients with COVID-19 lung disease. We've had fabulous support from the regulatory authorities. So to give you some idea, a 24 hour approval is really unprecedented. You'd be talking months, 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 if not years of regulatory time to try and get these approved, but they were fabulous. We've had uh, the download of many, uh, many designs for international use, and we've done it all with no patents, I've learned about contracting with the government and I've learned as a novice about licensing for international use. I just want to finish off by thanking all the people on this email. This is the UCL team. They were truly, truly brilliant. They come from diverse backgrounds, from engineers, mechanical engineers, uh, clinicians and, and myself as a, as a respiratory physician. So thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you, David. Um, it, it is, of course, uh, an old saying Necessity is the mother of invention. Indeed. And, and it may be that it, 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 you know, 
saying it worked here doesn't mean that, that we don't need a patent system in the days when the necessity is not of the same order. Yes, and that's a fair point. And remember, remember, we have approval from the MHRA, the, the Medicine Regulatory Authority, as a derogation from the Secretary of State for a device in a pandemic. So this is not a CE approved device. Yeah. So we now need to get this CE approved if it's going to continue beyond the derogation, which is extended to September. And, and we also need to think about if we get a CE approval, how we then can distribute them around the world. Mercedes is happy to manufacture them, but we need that badge in order for for, for, to, to extend beyond September. Um, I, I have one other comment. Uh, I'm not sure you, it wouldn't have been quite a sensible thing to patent the improvements anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, not for the purpose of doing anything in, in this current crisis, mm -hmm. but uh, I can see uh, uh, in the future, somebody else might take what you did and improve it even some more and patent it and you UCL and we'll get nothing for it. Um, and what's more, you would have no say in what's going on, whereas you would have done. Uh, but I don't suppose you had time to think of that at the time. <laughs> <laughs> You're back to Bob Geldof and thumping the table and people are dying. That was, that was, that was, that was the, the driver. One thing I was very conscious though, that when we did the international licensing, I was very keen that no one made a profit out of this device. So we were doing this for humanitarian purposes. So I didn't want someone to make it and then sell it as a huge profit. So in the contract, in the license, it does say that you have to make them at cost and distribute them for humanitarian purposes. And if you make a profit on them, then we can come after you. I'm not sure how we do that, but nevertheless, it does, <laughs> it does say that in the contract. <laughs> well, very, very good. Thank you very much indeed. Okay. Thank, okay. Thank, Thank you very much. Um, our, our, next, our next speaker, it is Thomas Graney who arrived in time to join in that but I'm sure you enjoyed that very much indeed Thomas but, but you are now going to be dealing with um, really medicines and vaccines which are possibly different from devices not known for not patenting Robin <laughs> but I must say I was fascinated to to listen to David in particular since I know during one of my fitness sessions I'd seen the story of the ventilators watching the BBC uh, some weeks ago uh, and and it's even more impressive now to listen to the story in terms of intellectual property in COVID-19 and pharma the you know, key message from our side is, and there I echo what David just said, this is not business as usual, it's business as unusual. But we from the industry, we are deeply conscious that our scientists basically are holding the keys to first treating, uh, testing, treating, and then containing SARS-CoV-2. And that is a huge responsibility because I've had a debate uh, early on with my communications director, whom you know well, and did say, uh, you know, this is first time since 1918 Spanish flu. And she told me, Thomas, you can't make that comparison. Uh, in the meantime, I think many people have made that comparison. It is really a combination of 1918 with 1929, when you look at the huge economic impact uh, COVID-19 has on all of us. Now, science is holding the keys. And when I look at SARS-CoV-2, to some extent, we were benefiting from the knowledge gained from SARS. But SARS actually is a coronavirus, which by the time companies who had invested in R&D were ready to move into clinical trials, the patients had gone. And earlier this afternoon, uh, I hosted a global media conference with the leaders of four of the world's biggest vaccine manufacturers. And one of them said, we really, we have to speed up. It's a race against time. And one of the challenges is in our parts of the world, I'm in Switzerland, the restaurants have reopened uh, two weeks ago. You won't find many candidates for clinical trials. And if you can't run clinical trials, uh, you might be tempted to run challenge trials. I have to admit, 
challenge trials means that you potentially infect volunteers, you know, with viruses who make them sick. Now that raises a tremendous amount of African questions, but therefore science is holding the key. We, as David just mentioned in this marvelous example of the ventilator, we learned about SARS-CoV-2 on January 10. What's interesting and I think relevant, SARS-CoV-2 was published, the genetic sequence data, the genome of SARS-CoV-2 on an open science platform, a platform which was basically created many years ago by uh, academic scientists watching seasonal influenza viruses. And that was the first time, in the meantime, you have 32,000 uh, uh, genetic sequence strains which have been published on that platform. If it hadn't been published and openly available for everybody, we might still negotiate uh, material transfer agreements with countries unwilling to share the virus because they think there's a lot of money. Who published it? Who published it? The, the, the Chinese? Who, who published this, this and put it on? It, it came from the Chinese, but published what it was by G8, which is a association based on German law. But the key guy of G8 is a man called Peter Borgner, uh, who is a German American, and he deserves a lot of praise for the work he does and also for his fight to make these you know, this information publicly available. Now what's important because of that, when you think it was two months later till WHO declared a pandemic, COVID-19 a pandemic, within few days of WHO declaring COVID-19 a pandemic, we had the first emergency use approval uh, in the US by the FDA for the PCR tests, uh, which David just mentioned, done by Roche. And one of the responsibilities we feel as big pharma, although you have many, many brilliant scientists around the world, in university labs, in hospitals, in clinics, at the end of the day, if you really want to deal with COVID-19, you not only need brilliant science, you need manufacturing capacity, you need to know how to scalable, and nobody but big multinational corporations have know-how and the, the capacity uh, to scale up testing, vaccines, and therapeutics. When it comes to IP, I honestly and assertively say IP has not been a hindrance in any way to us tackling COVID-19, quite the opposite. It has been an enabler. Without a flourishing innovation ecosystem, we would not have more than a hundred vaccine candidates. We would not have more than a thousand clinical trials ongoing already now. And companies actually able to draw on learnings from the past because we knew about SARS, about MERS. We had the experience with finding and developing an Ebola vaccine. The shortest time frame ever to develop a vaccine was four years. And we did have companies early on, within a week of WHO declaring this a pandemic, had leaders from the industry joining me in Geneva for global media free, uh, briefing, committed to doing collaboration on an unprecedented scale, to sharing data, to work with others, to team up in partnerships with academia, with the universities, with biotech, with others, and also committed to sharing capacity, for example. I've not heard any instance, for example, I've, even in my country, I've seen examples, we had shortages of masks, we have shortages of PPEs, similar to what I've seen in the NHS, and you had price hikes there. I've not heard anything about this kind of behavior within the pharma industry, quite the opposite. For example, pharma companies all in all, they have donated in cash or in kind more than $700 million in many countries in the world, but they've invested billions of dollars at risk because as I mentioned uh, already, we need a vaccine. Many companies are now in the race 
to be the first or among hopefully several who will come up with a vaccine. None of them know right now whether their vaccine will be safe, will be effective and is scalable. The best hopes in terms of short speed, rapid, is a new technology, the messenger RNAs. The challenge is it, there's been no approved messenger RNA vaccine so far in the history of vaccines. It's a new technology. The question about speed is one, it's potentially agile, but can we be sure that it's safe? And that's why when it comes to vaccines, many of us would love to have a vaccine at scale, big volumes available, maybe later this autumn, maybe even earlier when you read the media. Most people I talk to say, if we are lucky, we may have vaccines in significant volumes available by spring to summer next year. The companies who were with me today, like GSK, AstraZeneca, Pfizer, j, j each and every one of them said, we will be able to manufacture up to a billion dosages per year, next year, which is tremendous. If you imagine that the global vaccine capacity right now is about 5 billion, not including seasonal influenza, and there's no massive excess capacity, which needs, means this needs to be built up very early. And it is on the basis of what we already have. You had even faster, because before you have a vaccine, we all hope that some of the treatments work. And we have seen encouraging results, for example, from remdesivir clinical trials. We have seen encouraging results from some of the anti-inflammatory drugs, such as Actemra. What I see with many of these companies, they already now take decisions, not knowing yet whether their therapeutic will really work to scale up capacity. We have also seen something which I think is very relevant in the context of our debate. Companies have embraced voluntary licensing. They have gone to the medicines patent pool. Historically, when you look at our industry, uh, 20, 15 years ago, uh, you tried to stay a couple of miles away from the medicines patent pool because you saw them as trying to sort of take away your IP and run with it and actually also use it in countries where there are markets. In this case, for example, we IFPMA with the support of the member companies, we have supported the medicines patent pool decision to expand the traditional scope of the MPP during the COVID-19 pandemic and cover basically all relevant innovations for COVID-19. And we've already seen contracts, but beyond what's happening with the medicines patent pool or bilaterally companies looking for licenses they know and trust. And trust is important because when you look at what we are dealing with, for example, therapeutics, you really want to be sure that the ventilator works. That's why I think the UCL has an interest that their ventilator works. You want to be sure that the safety controls are there, that they, there's no, no cutting the corners. And apologies for the mishap in terms of my slides and my speaking. Uh, Lisa, you're doing a great job, but in principle, I'm already far ahead of where you are on the slides. But I don't think that you need the slides to get the gist of my message. The gist of my message is, we in the industry, we know that we are holding the keys. And one of the key elements, which is relevant in terms of the IP component, this is not business as usual. Therefore, what you see is collaboration among multinational companies, for example, GlaxoSmithKline uh, teaming up with others to offer the adjuvants because that will reduce the number of dosages you need. You see big pharma companies such as Pfizer teaming up with the German biotech company, BioNTech. You have AstraZeneca with the Jenner Institute and Oxford University, or you have uh, Sanofi Pasteur uh, teaming up with GSK, but also with a Chinese partner, because nobody knows what will work yet, but all of them have a deep sense of responsibility 
that we need to do whatever is needed to contain and in due course end COVID-19. And we also have to sense in terms not just of we hold the keys to the science, but we will also be judged on our commitments to making our products, therapeutics or vaccines available, equitable, available, affordable. I had several of the CEOs who joined me this afternoon firmly stating, similar to what I heard from David, we are doing this on a not-for-profit basis during the pandemic. I have had several others all emphasizing a deep sense of social responsibility and this needs to be affordable, not just affordable in uh, the poor countries where hopefully they will get support from donors such as Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Wellcome Trust, but also many countries. It also has to be affordable in our parts of the world. And I've never seen the industry so conscious that this is basically a defining moment. If we are able to come up with the therapeutics, treating patients with the vaccines, ending COVID-19, and we do this in a socially responsible way, I think we can sort of, as one of my friends recently said, move from being the antichrist to the Christs. My remark was, look at what happened to him. Therefore, you're working a little bit on walking on thin ice. But I think one of the elements, and that's why we are standing up, also at this time and moment, to defend our IP and argue the IP case and strongly emphasize the importance of voluntary licensing, because a thriving innovation ecosystem, a flourishing one, has enabled us to respond so fast. The companies are deeply aware that they need to look for partnerships in terms of scaling up. They're doing that but they also have responsibility in terms of quality assurance and making sure that the partners they team up with can be trusted. There is always a risk in medicines that you will be confronted with a lot of counterfeit or fake medicines. If that's also one of our responsibilities in, in teaming up with the partners. But I'm confident that actually at the end of the day, science will win. I'm also confident that doing right now business as unusual, doing the right things, therefore not just giving away the patents, but making sure that the patients around the world get the medicines or vaccines they need is something which is needed. That's why we also are a founding partner of this Accelerator Act, Accelerator, which was called into life by the philanthropic organizations such as Welcome and Gates, WHO, the European Commission, many, many member states. And we are there together with the likes of CEPI and Gavi. And we are doing our bit and we are deeply conscious, as I said, the world is watching us and we better continue to do, to do the right things. And we can do so because we can afford to do though, so based on a strong intellectual property system. Thank you and back to you, Robert. Thank you, Thank you very much indeed. Uh, just one question uh, which I wanted to ask is, uh, how important are patents in the world of vaccines? Not much, not much. Uh, you wouldn't have any company which just gives away, you know, their intellectual property. But the mere fact that we never had a compulsory license on a vaccine shows you really, you wouldn't gain much by having a patent. What you need is 10 or 20 years know-how in manufacturing, in development, in knowing what's needed. And, and that's something which in the vaccines area is, is very different from the pharmaceutical area. And of course, within the pharmaceuticals, as you know, uh, small molecules are different from biologics and that's why, but in the vaccines area, patents are really not uh, core and center. Could I ask this, is, is, uh, there are no generic vaccines, are there? Um, generic companies don't make them? Actually, within, you do have as partners of Gavi and next week there's the replenishment launch of Gavi and one of my concerns, of our concerns is,
I had to fall to focus on COVID-19, the Gavi replenishment, which is hosted by the UK government in London on June 4th, might not get the equal success to what Global Fund had at their replenishment in October in Lyon, because it's so crucially important. When I look at Gavi, it is by far the best health investment the world ever did, not least, by the way, to the drive of Bill Gates, uh, who is much maligned right now. But the Gates Foundation has done a lot together with governments such as the UK, one of the biggest funders of Gavi. Uh, but this is really something which we, we need to, to make sure that we do not forget the normal immunization programs out of all our concerns on COVID-19. You're mute to me. I can't hear you. So my fault. Patricia, an economist view of what's going on. <laughs> yes, thank you very much, Sir Robin. Let me share my screen. Okay, so I will try to be brief um, <clears throat> and say just a bit about um, the economist view of patents and COVID-19 medicines. Um, and how I see things playing out within the current patent system and insurance frameworks. Uh, so, oops. my slide is not advancing. There we go. Uh, just starting off with some basics about uh, the economics of medicines. First, the rationale for, pat for patents in market-based economies. The basic uh, ideal of market-based economies is that we rely on competition, on free entry, to drive prices down to marginal cost. Uh, but the issue, of course, is that when you have something like an innovation that requires significant fixed and sunk costs, an innovator would not be able to recoup those without a patent. And therefore, a patent is a grant of limited monopoly power to the innovator to give them at least an opportunity, not a guarantee, but an opportunity to price above marginal cost to recoup that investment. The question of what is the optimal patent length and breadth is a very tough question. There's no one answer fits all, but the basic principle is that we want to be balancing the cost to current consumers from allowing pricing above marginal cost against the expected benefit to future consumers from potential new products. So that's the theory. The reality is we work in the world of the WTO pat uh, patents with tw a 20 year patent and then country flexibilities within that. There's absolutely no evidence that this 20 years is what is optimal, but uh, nevertheless it is what is. But in practice, the country specific rules regarding such things as follow-on patents and the regulatory details regarding market entry are at least as important for patent life and incentives in the pharma, biotech and vaccine industries. So second point in the economics of medicines is the importance of insurance and therefore reimbursement and pricing. The point about insurance obviously is to assure affordability and access to health in general including medicines most high income countries have comprehensive insurance like the nhs in the uk and this has the virtue of giving patients financial protection but that means that they are totally insensitive to prices because someone else is paying and this unfortunately creates an incentive for producers to raise prices potentially above the simple monopoly level they would get from patents and less payers limit reimbursement. And so in response to that incentive, payers in all countries with the exception of the US limit the reimbursed prices for patented drugs, usually using some formula based on some measure of incremental benefit uh, relative to existing drugs or what is called cost effectiveness in the UK, you would be familiar with it as how NICE goes about measuring the cost per quality adjusted life year, and the price of a new drug must be set so that the cost per quality, the incremental cost per quality, 
does not exceed the threshold, which is currently around 30,000 pounds. So in applying this sort of pricing approach to COVID medicines or vaccines, the questions are, what are there special costs and benefits to be included? And then most importantly, should the threshold be higher or lower for COVID therapies, which would in turn imply higher or lower prices? And third, should exceptions be made to this general formula when some of the funding has come from public sources? Uh, if we look at COVID medicines, uh, I would categorize them as in three types. First, medicines based on existing drugs where the existing patents and regulations really matter. And the advantage of these sort of follow-on situations is that they only require phase two or phase three trials uh, to show efficacy and safety for COVID. But the problem is financial incentives may be weak precisely because not much IP is left. Uh, and here there's a real difference between biologics and small molecule drugs, particularly in the US. The US has pretty ge uh, generous rules for allowing patentability of new attributes, new formulations, to the point where there's real risk of un undue evergreening, especially for biologics, the example being the Embrel patents, which will not expire till 2028 in the US, they expired in 2015 in the EU. Um, but for the small molecule drugs, many of those follow-on patents are successfully challenged by generic companies. And what turns out to be the effective bar to generic entry is the data exclusivity granted to the originator's data on their clinical trials. And that data exclusivity is enforced by the FDA in the US, by the EMA in Europe. Unfortunately, it's set at five years for small molecules in the US whereas it's 12 years for biologics, it's 10 years for both in the EU. And that has the effect of really limiting uh, incentives for trying to pursue small molecule drugs for COVID. And for them, I think we will have to rely on public trials uh, without licensing to generic producers, at least in the US. Uh, for new therapeutics, uh, we have the advantage that the pathways are known uh, thanks partly to the factors that have already been described and some of the known compounds are already being trialed and the regulatory approach is very fast. And so there is, there are significant factors that will make R&D costs reasonable. The volumes are potentially, for, for treatments, potentially reasonably large depending on the indication and off-label use. And the standard reimbursement approach, I think, makes sense. Uh, and it is likely to result in prices that are fairly modest compared to some of the prices that we've seen, which can get into the thousands, even hundreds of thousands of dollars for cures for chronic fatal diseases, the case in point being hepatitis C drugs, where the possibility of eliminating years of expensive healthcare plus a very expensive end of life treatment and returning people to good health actually justified very high prices. But this, that situation is not on the books for uh, the COVID medicines because the medical costs are not that high and it's an acute, not a chronic disease. Uh, so affordability should not be an issue for payers unless we get to the situation where multiple therapeutics are being used in cocktails and that, especially for early stage or mild disease, where many, many patients will be involved, uh, that could be an issue. The vaccines, the issues really differ between high and low income countries, I think. Uh, the R&D costs, I think, will be relatively modest uh, compared to some vaccines and regulatory uh, tra fast tracking is underway. Uh, and as Thomas has described, private uh, collaborations are underway and public funding has been committed. For high income countries, the issue will be affordability within current health budgets. I'll come back to that. For low-income countries, same issue as well as the issue of the need for high volumes. And here I think there really will be a need to call in, uh, probably through, and hopefully through voluntary licensing, some of the low-income country producers who are already currently the main suppliers for most of the vaccines and therapeutics being purchased by Gavi for the UNICEF countries. 
And so it's uh, the hope, I think, is that the LDC situation will be uh, greatly facilitated by Gavi funding and UNICEF purchasing to enable mass vaccination. So in the high income countries, I think the real question is, uh, should we be using a lower cost per quality threshold for a COVID vaccine? And I think the evidence and the, the sort of theory on this suggests yes. The point here is that, as I said, the right price is one that considers the cost to current generations versus the expected benefits to future generations from incentivizing R&D. Right now, we're in a situation where globally, GDP has taken a major hit. We've got a major depression on the horizon and huge demands on public budgets, which means that the opportunity cost of funding to health budgets is higher, and that implies a lower threshold and lower prices. I am not concerned that this will disincentivize future R&D for vaccines of high volume because the price is being reduced precisely because the volumes are so high. So the high volume offsets the low price to yield more than adequate revenues. Uh, I think this sort of approach also takes care of the issue of public funding, which has been significant for the COVID vaccines and is a much more sensible approach than the one of using margin rights, which was mentioned, is available under the Bayh-Dole Act in the US. Margin rights has never been used. It doesn't solve the pricing problem. It sets a really bad precedent, whereas setting a value-based price would deliver a reasonable ROI on public funding and solve the pricing problem. Um, finally, for less developed countries, I think uh, that it's highly likely voluntary licensing will be used as it was for the hepatitis C drugs, along with differential pricing by the major suppliers. And that did achieve reasonably affordable hepatitis C drugs. The hope is this will happen with the vaccines, but that for the poorest countries that Gavi funding and UNICEF purchasing will step in uh, to negotiate prices for the least developed countries, that PAHO will negotiate for Latin America. And by the time that we get to middle income countries coming online, that there will be multiple vaccines and that in the vaccine world, does yield uh, competitive pressures on pricing. So hopefully there should be affordable vaccines uh, for all countries through these various mechanisms and the power of competitive pressures. Thank you. Thank you. So Robin, you're muted. So Robin, you're muted. Unmute, unmuted. There we go. That worked. No. Um, yeah, that's better, Robin. That's fine. Okay. Very good. We've got five minutes left. Um, we could go on a bit. I don't know what people want. We, we, uh, is the team ready to go for, for, for a few more minutes after half past? Thank you. All right. Um, I, I've got a bunch of the questions here. One of them, which I'd like, and I gather Mark, you volunteer to answer, what to do about um, inventions um, and technologies invented by universities and research institutions? Yeah, I, I mean, you know, I think the answer is not necessarily any different in principle than anyone else. Um, uh, bearing in mind, though, right, the um, uh, the other incentives uh, that uh, exist to to engage in research at universities besides the possibility of patents, right? The the story that David uh, gave us, I think, is a great example of that. Um, uh, but a lot of the university inventions are also uh, publicly funded, uh, either directly or indirectly. Uh, they're funded in various ways uh, through the subsidization of the university system. That doesn't mean universities shouldn't hold patents. I think they can. But universities ought to think quite seriously both about sort of whether they need a patent, right, um, uh, in a particular technology, uh, and, um, uh, and then what to do about it. Um, 
A number of universities in the United States uh, and some in the UK have uh, have either joined the Open COVID pledge or or made similar pledges that they would release this technology um, uh, without cost. Uh, where patents are useful, it seems to me it's primarily in circumstances where if you don't have a patent, uh, no pharmaceutical company will partner with you to turn this into a, a working drug, uh, right? And, and the patent then serves as a contracting mechanism. But I don't know that universities should be or, or frankly will be thinking, all right, how do I maximize my income from the, from the inventions we've developed? Anybody else want to comment on that? I'm sorry? Does anybody else want to comment on that and be, what university should be doing? No, okay. Um, my next question, which is not actually on the list because it occurred to me as a result of something I was hearing on the radio today. And the chap had written a book about the, the fact is he says that we're going to have more and more pandemics. Uh, the, we've had some close runs in the last 20 years, and he thinks that we're going to have uh, more and more pandemics. Um, should the world be organizing some sort of system for dealing with the next pandemic, and in particular, um, how companies uh, and universities should cooperate so that it doesn't all have to be made up on the day? Anybody want to comment on that, David? Yes, yeah, so, so I agree, Robin. Uh, if, if you think about it, so um, my, my view is that we saw the pandemic coming from uh, China sweeping across Europe and then coming to the UK, and, and we didn't do anything about it. We watched it arrive and then reinvented everything on the hoof, as, as, as has happened to every country that it swept through. So I think, I think a global response and learning from each other is really important at, at the outset. And if you look where we are now, we're using the sort of devices that were used in the 1918 Spanish flu. I mean, we are socially distancing, we're using masks and we're washing our hands. And, that, and that's about it. So, so I do really think that we need to have a global preparedness uh, grouping. I think we need to be far more, far more aware of these zoonotic infections, things that come from animals and transmit through to man and then transmit through the world. This has been a huge wake up call for the world. Ideally, hope that we learn the lessons and that, that we, we prepare better for the next one. And if I may, my final comment, if I may, is that I don't think this is going to go away anytime soon. I, I thought Thomas put it, put it very nicely. It takes four years to develop a vaccine. HIV has been around since I was a medical student, and, and that still, ha still doesn't have a vaccine, and there are no vaccines for coronavirus. And even if we do get a vaccine, just, just to be a bit of a, a slight pessimist, which is not my nature, but to be a pessimist is that the vaccine studies that we've seen from, from Oxford seem to maybe prevent people developing severe disease, they don't break the infectious chain. So, so uh, we're asking a lot of a vaccine and we're, we're banking all our hopes on actually achieving one and it looks difficult. Thomas, am I, Thomas, am I being overly pessimistic? I believe we will have not one vaccine, but several vaccines, but it will take a while. Kate O'Brien from WHO, who knows a lot about vaccines, said the lucky will have one by early summer next year, but then everything needs to go smooth. And she did say that I've never come across a vaccine development with, where everything went smooth. But I do believe that we are really now seeing an unprecedented effort. And, and when I talk to people, apparently one of the elements is this coronavirus seems to be fairly stable, which, for example, seasonal flu is not. Uh, and, and that's why I think there is optimism that we can find one. But there are still so many things we don't know about the virus, about the, the immune system, about we need to make sure that the vaccine doesn't create more harm than good. When I look at the anti-vax movement, we better make sure that safety tests are not uh, shortcut. I agree. I agree. And, and Thomas, there, there was a signal, I think, in the early coronavirus uh, vaccines back in the early 2000s that there may be an enhancement of mortality in some people who had them. Uh, yeah. so, so we just need to be very careful that we don't rush these through without proper assessment. I must say, that's, let's say that's one of the advantages of big pharma Big Pharma is too big to run risks. Uh, you, 
a small company is easier trying to run the risks because the only, either they make tons of money or they go bust. And if you go bust, you can't be sued. Big Pharma, you know, is too big to run the risks. I've seen this when it came to xenotransplantation debates uh, more than 20 years ago. And I think it, it is important and we need the regulators there. Uh, I echo what you said about the extraordinary uh, collaboration of regulators around the world, whether it's FDA, EMA, MHRA, or PMDA, they really also have this sense of duty and do work 724. Thomas, I'm going to ask you. Yeah, could I? Could yeah. I just could I just follow up um, on that? In the U.S., in the case of I think it was swine flu, the companies insisted on being assured of indemnification by the government before they were willing to sell the the vaccine. Thomas, do you have a sense of whether the companies are looking for that sort of indemnification for the vaccines? It is the norm in Barta, and you do need some indemnification, but the indemnification doesn't come with taking risks because I think our companies are extremely sen uh, conscious of anti-vax movement, and that's why you can't cut corners. But yeah, the indemnification is an important element uh, of the system because otherwise uh, you might not get, you know, the at-risk investments which is needed at the speed which is needed. Yeah, the, the U.S. Has, um, has an existing vaccine harm compensation system, right, for the very small number of people who have adverse reactions to existing vaccines. In order to, to drive widespread adoption, we basically agreed to sort of compensate them, and there's actually a special court system to do it. Um, uh, you know, I think that's, that would end up applying pretty well here. The bigger risk, as Thomas indicates, is um, if you have a vaccine and it has a sort of wide scale or widely reported adverse reaction, people get scared off and don't take the vaccine at all, and that's far worse for, uh, for the world. Well, you're on mute, I think. And one, here we are. Thomas, I've got another question. We've got an unprecedented amount of cooperation going on between different companies big companies. This is the kind of thing that is normally looked upon with a frown by the competition authorities. This is really touching upon next week's, sub one, next week's subjects, but you're here and you're not coming next week, um, at least not as a speaker. Um, is there, has, there, has there been any reaction from the competition authorities about, about companies getting together and saying, let's fix something, produce something jointly? Companies do not come together, let's fix something in terms of competition law. Uh, at every meeting which we have with our vaccine CEOs and committees, we do have a legal counsel from one of the big law firms there, because we don't want to end up in orange jumpsuits you know, and handcuffs. But uh, what, what is obvious, I, I do believe that there is an understanding, and I see it between academia, public and private, there's a need for sharing data, there's a need for collaboration. Uh, they also, when it comes to the contractual arrangements, those are normally between two companies. Those are not involving, and when it comes to, for example, contracting with CEPI or Gavi, you will have individual companies contracting and not the group. When you talk about the science, when you talk about how to make progress, there everybody wants, you know, the sort of almost open innovation, open sh sharing on an unprecedented scale. But, and I have seen debates, for example, with the European Competition Authorities and the European Commission has indicated, look, this is so important that uh, we, we, we are interested, for example, in discussions on capacity sharing of manufacturing. Yeah, exactly so. I mean, I that's a slightly unusual approach to the law. The, the, the competition authority you know, don't make the law. And so this is, this is actually almost where we started. The laws are silent. Competition laws just go silent because there's nobody to enforce it. Um, uh, I, mean, I, 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 I think we might see something different right uh, after the fact if there's a collusion on price, for instance. 
but I, I mean, maybe both with IP and competition law. I, the way I think of it is not that they don't that they go silent; it's that they're written for a for a world right that moves at a certain scale and has certain uh, characteristics. And you know, we see efforts to try to kind of work around and within the law in order to to to, to respond to the emergency. Right. So David's example of uh, you know we rushed together and put this thing together and we got it out and then um, uh, and then the regulatory agencies worked really fast and uh, fast and they got approval but we got it out we built it and then got approval and not uh, you know not not vice versa um, so I, I think it might be and, and it might be the same way with intellectual property right I mean the it's going to take years to resolve any intellectual property disputes uh, that arise out of this uh, stuff but the but the the agreements, the contracting, the deployment of the technology, my guess is going to happen in the shadow of IP, but not sort of dictated by IP in most cases. Well, probably we've come to the end. It's been absolutely brilliant. Thank you all. I hope the, the silent audience, which I can't see, could clap. <laughs> <laughs> Individually around the world. <laughs> we left for a drink about half an hour ago. <laughs> <laughs> I need to be in now. I've been on the road since 6 a.m. <laughs> and, and thank you, Lisa, for fixing it all and keep making it all work. Uh, she's a genius. And if, perhaps we should put you in charge of all anti COVID measures. And then it would be fixed. We do well. Thank you all very much. Thanks, Lord. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye.